Demerara, Anessa Quibo, 99.1 FM. Burby's 99.5 FM. Kite Radio. Hours 13 in Guyana, and we do apologize for the late start of today's edition of COVID 19 and elections. What we had a bit of a, a technical stumble there, but nevertheless, it's time to begin this afternoon. The helm of the program is senior journalist of Kaitru News, Mr. Leonard Gildari, and we now have Dr. Yoga Mahadio joining us. And as guests today, they have attorney at law and PPP candidate, Mr. Charles Ramson. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon there, Kevin Smith. I'm not sure what is happening with our internet in Guyana here. I'm taking some blows lately, um, but I want to say good afternoon. The weather seems to be a mix between the bad weather of last week and the good weather of yesterday. So I want to say good afternoon there to PPP's uh, candidate and attorney at law, Charles Ramson Jr. How are you, sir? Yeah, it's good to be here, Leonard. It's good and to see you, and it's good to see Yog as well. It's been a long time since I've been able to have any kind of uh, interaction with you guys well it's good to see you guys you look well yoga's wearing blue too yoga what, what, what's up with this blue neutral colors <laughs> <laughs> it's a mix between uh green and red and orange and so i leave it there but i want to say good afternoon to uh wherever you are wherever you're joining us from all across Guyana to my folks down in Diamond. And it doesn't mean that I love them more than anybody else, but of course it has a special place in my heart. I live there. So I want to say wherever you're joining us from across Guyana, uh, the Caribbean, uh, New York, uh, North America there, uh, a good day to you people. And of course from Europe and our neighbors here right uh, in Suriname, a good day to you. So let's get right into it. Um, yoga, there's some news coming out today. Uh, let me tell you, l- let me start off with a couple of things before we go straight into uh, Mr. Ramson. Um, I've been talking to some folks, some uh, experts across Guyana when it comes to who are, who are supposed to be advising when it comes to COVID-19. And I want to tell you the news is not that very good. Um, we have to be bracing ourselves uh, the prognosis uh, does not look good. Uh, we might have to look at the, down the barrel of this thing looking up more than a year. Um, it's going to take at least six months before we have a very clear idea. But you don't have, according to projections, we don't have a vaccine maybe in another 18 months. Um, and then, of course, everybody, all the small countries like ourselves, would have to be scrambling to purchase uh, the vaccine when it comes comes out and uh, God help us uh, when we have to stand in the line for that vaccine. So uh, the questions would of course arise when it comes to our preparedness and the news is also not looking good. Our borders are being infiltrated. Um, the various parts of Region 9 especially and in Region 1, Region 1 from the Venezuela border there and of course, Region 9, Brazil, big wide open spaces there. People have been walking across the, the, the rivers there, getting across the other side, and there's some cases that you're hearing that uh, recently uh, Region 9 and that letter area there would have recorded some cases there. We would have seen the cases go over 110 pers- uh, 10 persons in Guyana now testing positive, and, and so... That in itself, if you have Region 9 now having at least a couple of those cases, five, six cases, so it's not looking very good, although Region 1, um, I'm not seeing any figures there. Uh, that is because uh, the situation is very, very fluid there. But let's get right down to it. As of now, I saw Commissioner says, Gan Raj, of uh, when it comes to elections uh, 2020, says Gan Raj a few moments back, uh, about an hour or so, would have indicated, although there was a team from uh, the the COVID-19 task force there yesterday, they have not, as of one hour back, heard from them. That's the commission. So uh, there has been no official decision yet taken as to whether those uh, extra compensations would be operationalized. So, Yog, um, uh, very quickly before we get straight into um, 
Mr. Ramsley, anything else you want to say? Well, Leonard, thank you and good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon to Charles. Um, you know, to our viewers and listeners out there, uh, we, Leonard and I would have been saying a couple of things repetitively on this, uh, on this discussion program. For me, my view continues to be that Guyana stands unique. We have a bunch of politicians heading a national health emergency. And Leonard, as long as a group of politicians are going to head a health emergency, we are not going to get anywhere. Look, as of this week, Trinidad has started a phased reopening. And what is Guyana talking about? Going into a total lockdown. So there has to be, why can't we learn from our neighbors? Why can't we put the necessary health professionals in front? Even in the US, Leonard, like the man or hate him, when you see uh, uh, Mr. Trump in front of everybody, uh, in front of the news media, he always has next to him the relevant people that he could deflect a question or two to. Um, but here, you always have the politicians ahead. Of recent, uh, of the last week or so, I've been seeing the CMO um, coming out to be the face. But again, where is the holistic plan that the COVID task force ought to be working on, Leonard? And also, I must ask this. The COVID task force is headed by politicians whose most of their efforts seem to be spent at the Artisan Convention Center behind election matters. It needs to be separated because the health of people of this country is actually more important than anything else. We might win or lose an election depending on which side of the divide you're on, but if the people are dying and if they're sick and if they're not going to recover, then who will celebrate? Yes, I do. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Yog Mahadio. And let's get right into it. Uh, so we have a PPPC a candidate, an attorney at law, Charles Ramson Jr. I want to say welcome again to uh, Mr. Ramson. And let's get right down to it. You would have been paying very close attention to that recong that is happening at the Art Chunk Convention Center. Some of your thoughts, uh, Mr. Ramson. Um, first of all, I want to join at the outset, I want to join with the numerous persons and organizations uh, which would have called for the immediate uh, grant of approval from the APNU AFC led caretaker government to grant approval for the Carter Center, an accredited uh, election observer, to be able to return to Guyana so that they could complete their election mission. I want to also be able to share some legal advice uh, for the Carter Center, for the international community, and for the Guyanese public. That first of all, the the um, refusal to allow the Carter Center to return to Guyana uh, is a breach of the very order that this very recount is based on. So if I, I have the order right here, and I just wanted to read just bits of relevant information in relation to this particular issue, which is that it says in the order on page two, it says that the recount process shall be conducted in the presence of representatives of political parties that contested the said elections and observed by international and local observers accredited by the uh, Guyana Elections Commission. And then further down, uh, two pages down or so, um, it says that the persons entitled to be present during the recount process. It says representatives of the political parties that contested the elections, the CARICOM scrutinizing team, international and local observers accredited by GCOM. Just as you get so that you get an idea of what is an order, an order, just like rules and regulations and bylaws, etc., they are what's called subsidiary legislation. It, it is law in and of itself. So by refusing the Carter Center to return, this is a breach of a law. It is a, also a violation of their legal entitlement. Uh, and it, it, the, the second point that I wanted to make also 
is that if you look at the Elections uh, Observer Act, which uh, chapter one, uh, colon z one zero, it that act which gives the basis upon which election observers are allowed in the first place. It creates an offense for anyone who obstructs or interferes with an, an accredited election observer. So it is a criminal offense for there to be a refusal of uh, the return of the car to center. So I want to put it out there that, uh, number one, it's a violation of their rights and entitlements. Number two, it, it, their, the refusal is a criminal offense. And number three, it creates a huge suspicion as to what it is that the APNUAFC-led caretaker government, which leads this uh, COVID task force, this national task force, um, what else they have up their sleeves so that they would want to prevent the Carter Center from seeing. Now, um, Jörg, you would have listened to uh, what Mr. Ramson is saying there, but before I probably ask Jörg to slip in there because there's some legal aspects of it there. But I want to ask you very quickly, and maybe you could mix it up with her, his question, sorry. Um, the fact is, if you, if you would have seen how the, the CARICOM team would have come in here, they would have had to present uh, certificates or, or documents stating that they would have been tested. If not, you come in here, be tested, and then you um, don't do anything for about 48 hours or so. Uh, in this particular case, I, I think well, what uh, the sequence of events is that the authorities said, you have to apply back again. And Yog, I want to put that in context so you maybe to, to address that and maybe ask some questions. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. Uh, I, uh, over the past week, the, uh, Leonard, you and I would have been discussing that this notion of reapplying is, is really a false notion. I mean, the, the, G, the elections are not over. The elections are not over by any stretch because there has not been a declaration and swearing in of a legitimate government. And so by virtue of that fact, Leonard, I mean, Charles can, can chip in here. It is felt, and I support the feeling, the, the opinion that the observers who were accredited in the first place will continue to be afforded that accreditation until the elections are done. There was never a withdrawal. The order that, that they, the GCOM issued never state the word reapplication, reaccreditation, or anything like that. It is presumed, therefore, that those, it's, it's like Leonard, if the PPP was able to contest the elections, they remain a stakeholder in the recount as every other stakeholder. So this thing about, about reapplication is, is something that is very, very strange. Charles, your thoughts? I, I mean, it's pretty clear for everyone to see that it moved beyond the basis of logic, uh, where you, you've got to reapply on what basis that you need to reapply. You've had the American ambassador have to issue a statement saying that uh, that an application was made on their behalf, requesting that they join the flight um, at the same time when they were trying to get people, American citizens, out of the country. So unless you are trying to be uh, obstructionist and prohibiting them from doing what they are supposed to be doing in the first place, then it, clear, it, it says to me that this is a carefully designed uh, effort to frustrate the observation missions. And the truth is, is that uh, they, you need more people from those organizations to be able to conclude those reports because this election has been shrouded in so much allegations of fraud in relation to the tabulation of District 4. Leonard, just before we, we move off this topic of the accreditation of Carter Center, I just want to share this with you and Charles. On May 9th, uh, in fact, on May 8th, 2020, 8th of May, 2020, there was a letter that was written from Carter Center. There were emails between Carter Center and the lobbying firm of APNU AFC, JJ and B LLC. 
I wish to share this with the public. On May 8th, the letter from between these two, the emails between JJ and, uh, and BLLC and Carter Center stated as follows that the Carter Center sent accredited observers for the March 2nd election, and they assumed they would not need to go through the proper procedure this time around. And the proper procedure for the Carter Center at this point would be, and I'm quoting, to communicate its desire to return to the election recount. Nothing there says about reapplying. This is a letter that was submitted to the U.S. government that I'm reading to you here. And the final part, it says, for the COVID-19 status, participants from Carter Center must have a certificate indicating that they have been tested for the COVID-19 virus and have been cleared. The COVID certificate must be recent, issued within seven days prior to arrival in Guyana. Any participant not so cleared would have had to be quarantined for 14 days. Leonard, is there any doubt uh, that all the shenanigans uh, preceding and subsequent to this letter are basically just political ploys? Well, one could very well, based on that letter, they make some very, very clear conclusions. And um, uh, I, I think it would be, we, we could conclude one thing, uh, that one, if you're coming into the country, the, the authorities must be, uh, must, must be able to satisfy themselves that you are free, or at least you have a recent test or evidence, and you're producing such, that you could enter the country and you're free, and free, uh, you're free from that. But based on the letter that you would have um, read excerpts of that, I could see that there's no barriers uh, which uh, is blocking uh, Carter Center. Not only that, I come back to the point that you would have made there, which is, if you're already accredited, why am I accrediting myself? I saw a statement from the police this morning. Um, if you had a gun license, and it would have been expired at the end of December, they're now starting to issue, I think, um, uh, I think it's a car license. Fitness. The fitness. Fitness. Fitness as of Monday. So what happened if it was expired sometime before? It means that it was still uh, it was still there because they haven't started the processes yet. But in any case, I think it's uh, chalk and cheese we're talking about here. The fact is, the election is still live. It's still there. It's still it's still very much alive. So your accreditation cannot uh, expire just like that. Correct. And um, I just want to emphasize the point that I made initially that it is a breach and violation of their legal entitlement, and it is also a criminal offense to be to obstruct and interfere with the work of, of, of their observation. But let's, let's go to another issue here quickly, Leonard. Mm -hmm. So Charles, let us just say, uh, we, can, we can want, we can fight, you can kick up you, the opposition party or the contesting party, sorry. The contesting parties in this election can do whatever they want. You can protest, but let us just say Carter Center does not come to Guyana and nobody else comes. And let us say that in a week's time, these four poor people who are there from the CARICOM are extremely tired and they cannot continue. Uh, would the PPPC, of which you are a part, see or have a problem if there are no international observers or would you have a problem if no one else comes but CARICOM were to continue? I, I have a problem. I, I'm not speaking on behalf of the, the People's Progressive Party because any, de any decisions that uh, the party makes on positions, it has to go through our executive. Um, it, it, it has always been that way and it should always be that way because it's an organization and it's a political organization. In addition to that, though, these are very, very tricky and sensitive issues. If you're asking me what my view is, my view is that uh, I have a problem with anyone stopping or prohibiting uh, any election mission, observation mission uh, from carrying out their work. And, and that, that is probably why it was put in the law in the first place. Right. But, but my question is that let us say that there is whatever reasons for whatever reasons 
no one else is allowed to be here in this country. Status is that you have what you have presently. Right. So what's your comment there? No, so the, all of the missions have to be able to determine what kind of report they are able to submit based on uh, what they experienced and maybe they would be able to extract from the information that they have emanating from the public documents and from the, the uh, observer missions that are here. So I don't know what is their uh, modus operandi and, and standard operating procedure in a scenario like this where they have been blocked, but I suspect that um, they may have experienced something similar in, some, in other countries where there's a, attempts to uh, uh, blockade or block their ability to um, vigilantly observe elections. And so I think that there may be similar type of precedent that may have, may have been uh, charted before and applied and being able to be applied now. Right. So, Leonard, you get my point there, right? That let us just say nobody else comes. What does it mean to the elections, the recount process going forward? And just to just to deliberate a point a little bit more, Leonard, um, the issue with uh, so one of our viewers would have asked in sent me an inbox to ask, well, well, why do you need another international observer? One set is enough. And sir, there are many reasons why, and I would like to share this. Um, and both Len, you, both you and, and Charles can agree or disagree. The international reports work on a corroborative perspective. In other words, you have one set of international observers there. They are the CARICOM people. But if, let me say, the CARICOM people say that they observe uh, uh, the PPP um, having done something unacceptable, um, the PNC people will jump up and down and say so, and the PPP will respond, well, it's only you, nobody else is saying so, but there is nobody else to say so. You see my point, Leonard? And vice versa, if the, inter if the international observers present in the ground were to say, well, they observe the PNC or they observe APNU doing this, there is no other co corroborative body, international corroborative body, to say they agree or disagree. You see, case in point, on March 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, whatever, all the international observers have held one corroborative view that the procedures went haywire immediately upon Mingo's declaration. And you would have heard all the ambassadors speaking to that point, Leonard. So the issue here is that, yes, CARICOM is here to observe. Whether it is enough, it may not be enough to drive that stamp of approval that Guyana needs to put some confidence back in this country and its processes. And that's a very, very good point. Um, you, you know, I, I've been thinking about it. We've seen the Carter Center really being pushed. So how come we're not also seeing the uh, Commonwealth um, and those other uh, observers team who would have been here, EU and so on, pushing uh, themselves very aggressively? Is there any, a reason for that? Well, based on my information, there is no reason per se. Everybody has been caught with the COVID-19. Uh -huh. And a lot of these organizations work on I call you to come basis. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm telling you uh, we need you here or we invite you to come. Carter Center has operated on the principle that it basically never left. It left because of COVID, but not because of the elections, when the election procedures were to continue. But the, uh, the Canadian High Commission and the United States Ambassador, in interviews to both you and uh, I think uh, Enrico Wolford, would have said very, very clearly that IRI, for example, mm -hmm. they stand ready to come. The, or the EU Ambassador with you and me, he said very clearly, they're ready and willing to come. So I thank you, dear. Uh, if you're not joining us, elections, COVID-19, watch here on Kaicho Radio and with myself and Dr. Yog Mahadio. And we have as our guest here, PP PPP sees a candidate and attorney at law, Charles Ramson Jr. Mr. Ramson, I want to bring you to the recent uh, debate that has been going on, or rather statements and the fallouts from statements of Mr. Bruce Golden from the OS team. Uh, have you been paying attention to it? And what are some of your thoughts, especially with the fact that maybe he's not representing the OS team? Yesterday, David Patterson said that uh, uh, Bruce Golden was speaking in his personal capacity. Your thoughts? 
first of all, let, let me uh, say that no political leader uh, should be attacking a political leader of another country. Political leaders are uh, representatives of a body of people, a body of citizens of a particular country. Bruce Golding is, was not only the representative of uh, Jamaica, he was the head of Jamaica, the prime minister of Jamaica. And when I saw the APNU AFC's response to his specific instances of, of fraud in relation to the declaration for Region 4, um, and I saw the personal attack on him, I thought it was a national disgrace for us. People and countries go to war on far less in scenarios like that. And, and the fact that he is the, the head of mission for the Organization of American State, he has the right to be able to say that. I do not, if I went to their website yesterday and nowhere does it disclose that Mr. Golding is not the head of mission uh, uh, up to yesterday. So I would like if David Patterson, who has known, who is known for being untruthful time and time again, and, I, and if you ever want instances of that, I can list four instances where over the last three years, publicly he has lied about many things. He should be able to present any documents that he's relying on to say that Bruce Golding is no longer the head of mission for the, the Organization of American States. When you go to the, America, the Organization of American States charter, they, the principles of the charter says that they have to uh, promote and consolidate democracy. That's what the membership has to do. So you're signing on to this in any event. And the fact that he as says and wants to be able to say that this is what he has seen, they have attacked him personally. So let's pause for a second to just examine what he has said. He said that fraud occurred in the declaration for Region 4, the uh, Mingo's declaration for Region 4, and gave specific instances where, he is, where the box's results were inaccurate and, and showing with the statements of recount and comparison and, and making reference to the statement of polls, uh, which he, he would have seen because those are public documents. Instead of treating with the issue of fraud, taking those allegations of fraud, the government, the caretaker government, AP and UAFC, they are cheerfully unconcerned about those allegations of fraud. In fact, time and time again, we've heard them being willing to be declared the winners on these fraudulent declarations. They are willing to participate in uh, being sworn in on fraudulent declarations. And it defies logical belief. If you were to be a jury in this scenario of hearing all the allegations of fraud being made, and not just by Bruce Golding, incidentally, all of the observer missions have said that the, the declarations were not transport, the uh, tabulation for District 4 was not transparent and it was not credible. And if you go back to the statement for the head of missions for the ambassadors and high commissioner for the United States, Britain, uh, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, Canada, and the European Union, on the on the 6th of May, that joint statement that they made, it said they are deeply concerned about credible allegations of electoral fraud. And you can quote me on that. They themselves identified uh, issues of fraud in relation to District 4. So instead of the government, the caretaker government, the AP and UAFC, who participated in this contest, hearing about allegations of fraud, instead of them attempting to investigate whether there was fraud or not, they are willing to allow themselves to be sworn in on these declarations, and they still repeat it up to yesterday. Now, 
logically, if you were trying to become the president, if you're contesting an election of the president of the chess association or any kind of small body of, of where there's an election, and you hear observers alleging, not even part, not only participants, but observers alleging that there is fraud, you would want to investigate and to at least find out. David Granger and all of the AP and UAFC individuals, they constantly say they do not interfere, even though they have heard these allegations of fraud. We don't, it, it, it is not logical for you to hear that you're involved in, the, in a contest, hear that there are allegations of fraud by credible people, people that you have accredited, that you're involved in their accreditation, hear that there's instances of fraud and do not attempt to investigate. So I want to ask you, Mr. Ramson, very quickly, um, we are talking while this is happening. I saw news this morning that 21 Trinidadians who were stuck in Guyana since March the 22nd would have gone back. And these are people who would have been involved in the oil and gas industry. They were able to leave Guyana and they were stuck over here since March the 22nd and they were able to go back and they're going to be quarantined over there, but they're involved in the oil and gas. I want to ask you directly going forward and in terms of the, uh, everybody's paying attention to COVID-19 elections 2020. Going forward, what is the way, what is happening uh, very quickly in the oil and gas industry? And how do we move from here? How do we bring the, um, the train back on track uh, to keep reminding government that things are happening that is not necessary, COVID-19 and elections 2020? The, the first thing that you need to do to get things back on track, uh, Leonard, is to get a legitimate government in place, and you need to get a legitimate government in place as soon as possible. Why? Because in relation to COVID-19, there is a lot of assistance, financial assistance and technical assistance that's available to be able to uh, give Guyana the support that it needs to be able, uh, once we get a legitimate government in place. That's number one. Number two, um, in as much as they are, the APN UFC is attempting to weaponize uh, COVID-19, uh, there's very little that could be done in order to uh, assist Guyanese, considering that there has been no budget, considering that, that they're not receiving any kind of major financial assistance to tackle this problem in a very effective way. Uh, and the only way, like I said, is to be able to get that legitimate government in place. And what the strategy is at the moment in relation to the recount is to discredit the credibility of the elections, elections that they claim that they have won, even though they would have submitted a dossier uh, to the United States government to say that it was a free, fair, and credible election. You've heard the Justice Singh say that this was a free, fair, and credible election. You've heard David Granger saying that this was a free, fair, and credible election. And a number of leaders within the AP and UFC saying that this is a free, fair, and credible election. So their strategy is to attempt to discredit the elections and, and hang on to power, which they have been doing since the no confidence uh, uh, vote was passed since December of uh, 2018. Now, in, as it relates to oil, all, all of being able to uh, get the oil industry back on track is being able to have the, the, the framework that imbues confidence into the oil industry that says that Guyana has its act together that Guyana is a safe place for foreign investment, and we've got to send the right signals to the world, a world that is looking at Guyana in a far more amplified way. And you don't, we have not been doing that for the last four and a half, five years. But Charles, but Charles, let, stick a pin there. Uh, sorry to cut, cut, cut in. Um, Leonard, mm -hmm. um, I want to go back to two things that would have been mentioned. Um, a couple of things, in fact. One is to, to the viewers and listeners out there. So while Charles would have been uh, uh, discussing his points there, I want to clear with people out there that uh, Mr. Golding, 
um, would have made his statement. But don't forget, everyone, the gentleman as the chief of mission to the Guyana Observer team was invited by GCOM to come here. He didn't come and squat on the process. He was invited. He was accredited. So to now say uh, something is wrong with this guy and to now cast all the aspersions. And for those people who are actually uh, saying that, well, he was involved in this thing and, and so forth and so on, they go and read up. And don't forget that um, uh, today, Leonard, the Miami Herald, mm -hmm. I, I shared it on my Facebook page. They, they did a, a good article of, of the, the status quo, the, where we are presently. And even the Miami Herald, a US-based newspaper, quoted uh, Mr. Golding as the chief of mission for the Guyana Observer team for the process of this, this Guyana election. So I just wanted to ensure that we clear that up because, you know, we love to be going around in vicious circles in Guyana. And we, uh, you know, somehow or the other, we as a people, we love to have the politicians dictate to us what we should think. And we forget that we can think right and think straight. So that's one. Two, Charles, I would like to differ with your statement there that um, political leaders ought not to call out each other. I believe a democracy allows us to call out anyhow, call out anyone, um, regardless of whether you're a head of state or not. Head of states can disagree. I mean, look what, what world leaders have, have been disagreeing with, with Donald Trump or look at what um, your party uh, the PPP feels that other head of state should be calling out uh, David Granger. So um, I think, yeah, I think, I mean, over the years, we have, been, uh, Guyana government would have been calling out many other governments. And stuff like that. I mean, I, I but, just want to touch on uh -huh. that point there, uh, Yo. So there's a difference between disagreement and a personal attack. The AP and UAFC media statement says that, it, that he was biased. OK, and that and he would go and stay at a certain place and a number of things that impugned his character and his ability to conduct his affair in a professional way. That for me but, but, is but a personal politics, attack as opposed to just saying we disagree but, with the statement coming out from uh, Mr. Golding, box four zero whatever. Charles, Charles, in politics, that's okay, isn't it? In politics, they, 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 I mean, anybody is going to... Politics, unfortunately, Charles, you, you're in the front of it, and you know, and you may have felt it. Unfortunately, modern-day politics has been reduced to mudslinging. Here's where, here's where I disagree. So I agree that internally uh, you should be able to... Well, that this is a par for the course. But when you go into uh, disagreeing, but at personal attacks uh, among states, meaning between representatives of states and international organizations, it becomes much larger and, it, and it, it's far more uh, egregious and it should never happen. And like I said, countries have gone to war in you know, the course of human history on far less. But just so that we're clear, this has not been an isolated issue. Look at the attack that the AP and UAFC made on uh, the High Commissioner of Canada. That was a personal attack on her, and it was something that I feel very ashamed about uh, as a Guyanese, and it was totally unfair for somebody who was uh, present when something was going on, which was nefarious and, and wicked, which was the, the uh, fraudulent declaration by the, uh, Mingo, Claremont Mingo, Correct. And notifying uh -huh. the commission. And they attacked her character and her integrity just for notifying them that that was uh, what was happening in Correct. the Ashman's building where she was present. And, and we can agree to disagree with the politics. I, for one, I believe that, uh, that uh, you know, you gentlemen and gentlewomen in politics, you, you, you know, the level at which you operate sometimes make us independent persons shake our head. I mean, I would remember one of the, the former government ministers walking into the, the U.S. ambassador's residence and, and, and literally, uh, I think Roger Lundson uh, used some very unkind words, um, you know, uh, to describe the feral blast 
that is what it is. But I, I mean, we can agree to disagree with it the way how, how uh, the, but the point here, Leonard, is that as you and I said it yesterday, and Charles, we said it on the same show yesterday that Mr. Harmon, in, in objecting to uh, Golding's statement, should object by presenting the facts of those boxes to which Golding is pointed. Full stop. There is Simple. no other. Way. That is exactly what I'm saying, yo. Do not get personal with international leaders. It, 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 is, it could be seen by him being a political leader and a leader of that country as an attack on all of the people that he represents and, and the entire organization that he represents. And at no point in time has the OAS said that he is no longer the head of mission or his views do not represent ours, etc. It is a larger body. And the OAS is a very large organization in and of itself. And it's not, Correct. like I said, it's, it's not the first time it's happened. We've seen the attempt to take away uh, the accreditation of all observers um, by Karen Cummings. And you heard the statement from Owen Arthur. Um, when he said that it is disrespectful to not only him, but the entire Commonwealth, the largest concentration of people in the, in in the world. And let me uh, let me just jump in here. I want to ask you, gentlemen. This is something that's bothering me. I've been looking at it, but I want to ask directly: Do you believe that Bruce Golden's statement was a little too preemptive, maybe, or a little too early in the whole game because we still have the counting going on? Okay. So if, here is what I've seen the AFC and APNU are, are saying. They're saying that if you observe fraud, put it in your report, but let the swearing in happen anyway and let whoever file their petition. That is in effect the saying that you are witnessing a, 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 a robbery and that you should not say anything. So somebody is coming to your house. I'm standing outside uh, your home, Leonard, and uh, or yo. I'm standing outside your home. I see somebody uh, breaking into your home about to rob you, and I should just stay silent, wait for the act, the, the crime to happen, and then when it happens, and after all your stuff is stolen, and possibly, maybe even further, you guys are killed in your home, God forbid. I should be able to then tell the police what I saw afterwards so that they can per perpetrate their crime. The world doesn't do that, okay? Human beings don't do that. They, they shout and yell, thief. They would, at, at most times, even if they might be afraid, they would be at a distance and, and yell at the person, what are you doing there? Stop it, get out from there. Many, many times, just in a simple robbery situation, that is what happened. The AP and UAFC wants, it, it defies logic that they can say that there has been irregularities, ignore all the fraud, that the, the, the fraudulent declaration for Region 4, and then say that they should get sworn in on these results, the observers and the heads of mission and the uh, ambassadors, etc., have a right to be able to say, we are witnessing here something fraudulent that is not credible and, and transparent, something which they came here as, as observers to be able to, to observe and witness. So I want to, and, and then wrapping up this segment here quickly, Charles Ramson, Jr., attorney at law and candidate for the People's Progressive Party. Uh, I want to ask you, and we had diverted a little from the oil question. In wrapping up, what uh, do you say to the people of Ghana and to the government, to the interim government or caretaker government, as you would have called call them out a little, too, a little earlier? What do you mean when I say to them? What, to would the, you, the what would you I, advise? I say, what would you advise this caretaker government to do when it comes to this oil industry? As we speak here now this morning, we are learning that uh, I think Exxon Mobil would have suspended all construction when it comes to its headquarters in Ogledere. I think that was that, that had happened. It's now coming out. At least I didn't see it um, uh, at Ogle. They, they, it's a multi-million dollar um, or multi, yeah, multi-million U.S. dollars. Um, uh, facility that they are building there and project, yeah, 
That's right. And so that's suspended so, at the moment. So let, 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 in relation to oil, what people need to understand is that in this storm that we're having in the oil industry, the, the, the low price scenario is as a result of uh, a, a significant drop in aggregate demand. Okay? So that's pushed prices downwards in a very uh, substantial way. There is nothing wrong with the fundamentals of, uh, the, of how it is that oil is priced and being able to create a price equilibrium. However, what the flood, what this storm will do is kind of flood out the high cost producers. Guyana is not a high cost producer. And we will be one of the beneficiaries coming out of this uh, flood, this storm at the moment, uh, because we are a low price uh, producer or a low cost producer. And if you have got the, the right government in place that's got the right ideas and that's got the right policy and that puts in the right uh, uh, legislation and be able to imbue the confidence that is needed um, into the foreign investors who would be circling around for opportunities now that many of the low, the high price or the high cost producers would be would fail or become bankrupt. Um, they would be circling for opportunities. And if you've got a country that is a low cost producer, but also has got their act together and shows that, you know, they, they in relation to oil and gas, the regulation, the framework, uh, just the overall business environment is created so that they can come in uh, and, and invest in the country and, and help to employ people and to be able to transfer use of technology and, and uh, training, training in locals. Uh, if you've got that, it's going to help to make this industry move in leaps and bounds. And that's what one of the things that the People's Progressive Party was offering to the public. The public had an, a debate about who should be the government, and that is why they voted and voted the APN UAFC out of office. And that is what the recount will reveal, that the PPP won the election. So what, what is it that the recount will prove if, if uh, the APN UAFC allow, uh, if we are able to stop them from stopping the recount? because I know that they're working on strategies of trying to stop the recount. We've got to be able to fight them and push back. And once we are able to succeed, to allow the recount to continue all the way to the end, the Guyanese people will be able to see that the AP and UAFC have lied to their supporters and the Guyanese people, that they have won the elections based on the SOPs. They will see that the SOPs that we have uploaded on uh, on uh, online will match the statements of recon. So I do thank you for that. And if you've been with us for the last 40 minutes or 50 minutes or so, it would have been uh, attorney at law, Charles Ramson, and he's a PPP sees a candidate as well. I want to say thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ramson. And of course, uh, it's always been a pleasure talking to you. A uh, wide variety of things that he would have touched on there, including the recount, uh, the Carter Center, oil, and of course, Bruce Golden. Do have a pleasant uh, rest of the afternoon, sir, and we chat very soon again. Thank you. Thank you. And good to see you, and I wish your family safe as well. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And of course, um, uh, I, I know that you are paying very close attention. So we'll be touching base with you in the next a uh, couple of days or weeks uh, as we, we progress with this thing and hope that it gets over with and done pretty quickly. Thank you very much, dear Mr. Charles Ramson Jr. Thank you. See you guys. So, Yog, it's been a um, it's been a a pretty long day so far. Uh, what is the big news? I think, uh, according to Commissioner says, going to it's been 24 hours since the COVID-19 team visited. This is the Artichon Convention Center. They were there to assess uh, the possibilities of increasing the number of counting stations. He's saying there's not a peep from them. GCOM is ready to open up the new stations, but we wait. Um, what are some of your thoughts? Yog, um, lots of lots yes. of uh -huh. lots of things, Leonard. I, I, there. 
there are some of the stuff that's happening is almost laughable. As you know, last night you and I spoke to, um, on Room 592, we spoke to Miss Rhonda and Lamb. And we spoke about those uh, 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 four votes when there were two on the list, right? And I, I had a laugh when I saw somebody from the ACNU AFC posting that the PPP mysteriously increased its votes 200%. They didn't use two votes, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, you know, I've seen probably that post got about 50 or 60 shares. So my point in saying that is that, uh, you know, Leonard, the political parties are pushing their narratives and pushing it in a particular way to make us all follow that. Everybody here, everybody who listens, there, they have their own minds. They can make up their own mind about whatever is being said. And I want to say something else to you. I've seen some very illogical statements come out of the various uh, political persons. For example, I've, I've seen one report that says, um, uh, you know, that Miss Ali, Miss Amna Ali, claims that even if one person that, um, you know, one uh, to, to, to quote unquote, one dead voter, will throw the entire election, um, invalidate the entire election. There was a news um, report on that? I, yes, in one of the reports I've seen that. And um, the question I have here is that the one death certificate that I've seen circulating, that death certificate was was uh, was uh, um, issued, I think, sometime after the election, if I'm not wrong. And I don't know how and who got those certificates to be issued. My point is that the, the political parties are doing themselves, uh, and up to AFC, I mean, I'll call it how I see it, they're doing themselves no justice by making these illogical statements. Um, at a time like this, obviously they're speaking to their base. Obviously they're speaking to a couple handful of people that wants to hear something to hold on to. But in the long run, what it does, Leonard, we have seen some callers calling here with that. What it does is, is create a perception to the loyalists where reason and logic will not go anymore. And, and that is this, the, the problem we have in Guyana. This election will put it behind us, you know, but the wounds that will remain after this election, I don't know how many generations it will take to heal. Well, you know, um, Yoga, let's uh, this show here is about not only elections, but COVID-19. Let me tell you, it's been about three weeks now since the COVID-19 task force uh, has had a press conference. I can't remember the last time that they've issued a statement. We were supposed to see a press conference this week. I'd spoken to Imran Khan who is a PR uh, for that uh, that national task force. Why is it important? I think a lot of people would have been looking forward to hearing some kind of statements from the task force when it comes to, uh, at the very least, uh, relief for them. So uh, let me make well, it... Well, you check, you check the, 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 uh, the timelines. It says the recount start COVID task force stopped working, apparently, because... Well, I, I repeat my point is the group of politicians that has more to do with getting themselves elected than to run a national health emergency for this country. And that's a crying shame, Leonard. I, I can't put it any other way. But there's also that statement. And let me tell you, I saw the statement last night. And after this, we'd go straight into the phone lines and take a couple of calls. Uh, so Guyana set to surpass Trinidad and become CARICOM country with second most COVID-19 cases. As of yesterday, we had 113 confirmed cases and it stands, Guyana stands third in the list of CARICOM countries with the most cases. However, Guyana is poised to surpass Trinidad and Tobago, which is the number two slot with 116 cases. Trinidad has not had any new confirmed cases for several weeks. And Trinidad government has announced a phase plan to reopen the country gradually. Um, and let me tell you this: while this, while we having that uh, that uh, that situation there arising, the number of cases, yoga, and I think this is something that uh, you and I have been paying very close attention. The number of cases have been increasing this week, worrisome uh, in a worrisome way and deeply troubling way. We see uh, four more cases at the Palms. And I don't have to tell you how deeply uh, troubling that should be for the authorities of this country. Right. When you know right. that the most vulnerable persons, when you get it, are going to be the senior citizens. 
And so therefore, Absolutely. we have not had any statement coming out except one or two person. This seems to be as if it's business as usual. We carry on as usual down the road. Nothing is happening. A senior official told me this morning the country is operating. The country, and this is a health official, Yog. The country is operating despite the COVID-19 measures. The partial lockdown that we're talking about is operating as if it's business as usual. This thing is not this thing is not serious and they also projecting that this thing we're not gonna be over with it for two years. In the next six months, if you believe this airport is gonna be opened in a very short while, you got another thing coming. The, all the indications on the board says no. There's another story that is circulating is that uh, the authorities are contemplating a decision to have a total lockdown. Well, when we say a total lockdown, I hope that it's not a total lockdown in that sense because I think that what we're seeing right now, you multiply that maybe by 100. But what should be, do, what, what, what should be happening is some uh, enforcement when it comes to uh, the actual measures in place, meaning the minibuses, you saw that minibus uh, operator, the conductor and the driver being arrested yes, because they're allowing more people in the bus and without masks. I think there's a caller online. Let's go straight to the calls. Yo, uh, good afternoon, caller. You're on the air. Good afternoon. Mr. Gill, how are you doing? Hi there. See, there's the thing I keep talking about. How the reasoning is reason, y'all sure that the PPP win. But this thing here, you got to wait until... But the who's y'all? Who said that the PPP win? Who said that? Right now, here, here, um... Yo, Mario just said. Uh, no, we have not said that. that. What you would have heard is a uh, Ramson, I guess. Mr. Ramson, I guess. Yeah, I heard Ramson before, but I'm talking, but. Um, but you can answer the question. He's quite Yoke, capable of that. He just said, uh, he can put it as he see it. You will see nothing yet, because it didn't finish. It got so much more bucks to count. All right, let me put it this way. Let me say what PPP saying is truth. Mr. Gill, you are Mr. Gill, you are mistaken, and, and I'm not going to allow you to repeat that. I did not say anybody won. I said it is clear to the country and anybody who's looking on what's going on. I did not call a party's name for having won or lost. All right, listen to me, Mr. Yoke. This thing have a con going on, right? And when this con finish, where's the results? So then this is what we got to live by. Absolutely. I agree with you. Because I just but, hear, you know, I just hear Charles Ransom Jr. saying that um, even to the foreign dignitaries, they don't know what's going on. How are you so sure that they know what's going on? When you recon finish and they say, well, PPP win, they got to go in. If they say, I have to win, you heard, to go in. You heard my questions know, to Mr. Ramson, right? You heard me questioning him. Thing. So you yeah, got to tell these people when they come, you can't talk like they're on the station because they can cause problem. With the supporters, because even though when the results finish, it's sure that they lose. Them is the people who went trying to fraud. What are they going to tell the supporters? They're sorry? All right, thank you. So, thank you, thank you. So, uh, Mr. Gill, I, I think you may have heard the questions we asked of Mr. Ramson. Mr. Ramson is here and he has his opinion. And anybody who has an opinion, I think Gil Harry, Mr. Gil Harry, would remind the viewers and listeners that it is not the opinion of the station. It's the persons who appear here as, as guests. And um, uh, for your information too, sir, I, I think that I will go, and if you want me to say it, I will say it. I will go with the SOPs that I have seen published by the Stabbert News and the Kaiser News. I will go with the boxes I've seen shared by the observer missions. I will go with the photographs of the SOPs I personally took of a number of stations across the country. And based on those numbers, sorry, if you want me to share it, I will share it. So uh, let me tell you this. When it comes to COVID-19, the world has a number of corona cases, 4.6 million persons. Uh, over 306,000 uh, persons would have died, with 1.7 recovered. In the U.S. alone, uh, the corona cases, 1.46 million persons. Uh, 87,600 persons would have died with 317 persons recovered. So we head straight to the phone line again. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. You're on good the afternoon. air. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, am sir. I, 
Am I there to Kaichu Radio? Yes, you on air. Go ahead, sir. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Um, I have a question I would like to ask. Now, the question that I like to ask, when the major, when the major they're not getting sent from CARICOM, you all make a lot of comments about it and talking about it. When the major did not get what? The sent, the sent. Or yes. A good place so they could be there. Yes. All right. Even when they supply the tent, you all still talk about it. Yes. Now, I think it's yesterday, Mr. Barrett Gaglio embarrassed one of the media. Yes. From, from I think it's from Chronicle. Yes. And they had to put him to his place. Yes. Now, these are things you all supposed to be talking about. Have Jack you read Dio, the newspaper? Jack Dio, Jack Dio, sir, uh, uh, allow me to talk to you. Sure. Jack Dio cannot tell in the media what he feels like telling the media. The media have a right to ask him questions. Mm -hmm. And if he don't want to answer the questions, he have no right to tell them there's AFC and, uh, and they're from another party and they're supporting a party. That is not his business. His business is to go there and say what he wants to say, and when the media asks him questions, either he answers it or he don't answer it. But he can't embarrass the media like that. But I ain't hearing y'all saying nothing. I could remember, I could remember clearly when Jack Dio was in power. When they had the King Cutters, Jack Dio is the first, PPP is the first party that closed down real test I could remember that very clearly. And when, when Sharma went there, when they sent to Sharma, Sharma go there to, to throw tear gas from the, from the King Cutters. Tear gas is King Cutters. And they show Sharma in the King and carry down to the police station. Now, that is what they call dictatorship. I could remember clearly too, they closed down Sharma. They closed him down for about six months. Mm -hmm. They closed down Tony Zero for six months. He wrote the various business places and said, you all must not, you all must not, telling the business places, you must not take advertisements to even Kaicho Radio, Kaicho News. And I could remember clearly even some of the papers from the, the role we all make the paper with from coming into the country. I mean, that, that is what they call dictatorship. Mm -hmm. We don't want a dictator. We don't want a dictator government in this country. You understand? But and when the you. when when EFC when EFC when the government closed down the two or three estates, hear a lot of comments about it. The same PPP make a lot of comments about it, and it's their first closed down the estate. Tony Vera, go to Tony Vera. Tony Vera was talking about the the one of Barbies. The one of Bobby saw the, all the PPP spend a lot of money there, waste money. And now, you know, Tony Vera joined the PPP. Now, what we have to do, and I agree with the... So why do you think Tony Vera joined the PPP? Before. We are not dealing with SOP anymore. They got a silver board. We're dealing with SOR. When, when Thank you, GCOM, sir. When GCOM ready to give the... Um, the, the, we come, right? Who the say is the winner? We have to respect that. We have to respect if, it. Even if, uh, if, even if the, the, the process is fraud, is, is fraudulent? Where, the bottom line is where Carter Center is concerned, where Carter Center is concerned, whether the communist country or not, the vote is still coming. The vote is still coming. Okay. So why worry? Oh. Let me, let me ask you a question, sir. Go ahead. Do you think that from 1964 to 1992 that any of the elections were fraudulent? Well, well I believe all the elections, all the elections, let me tell you this. Let me tell you why I believe. APNU, probably the rig by bucket. And the PVP rigged by continue. You understand all right. what I'm saying? Both parties rigged. Thank you, sir. Both parties rigged. The AFC Good. So thank you, sir. Thank you. We can probably answer your questions off air. 
All right. Uh, uh, yes. All yeah, right. I, I do thank you for that. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And so uh, I want to make it very clear. Let me answer the first part and you could probably answer the second part. I think the, 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 the caller would have insinuated uh, that we haven't said anything with regards to my Jack deal. Well, let me tell you, this week I'm extremely proud of how the media would have handled themselves in the media tent there at the Artichon Convention Center. By Jack Dio, uh, they ops him right away there. And let's not beat around the bush. Right away there, with when he decided he's not going to engage a Chronicle reporter, the media went on him, including Kaichur News. Leonard Craig was there, and he did not get an easy time as well. I think yesterday I was looking at David Patterson, the interview with David Patterson, and so many other media persons that are going there. The media are not letting them uh, down very softly, Yog. And so when it comes to what the media has been saying with regards to my Jack deal, the caller, I would advise that the caller read our Kaito news as of yesterday. There was a very, um, uh, very uh, tough statement, a tough story when it comes to uh, that treatment by my Jack deal. And we could remember uh, in the past what would have happened too. But guess what? We're not going to stop doing what we have to do, whether it is this government, that government, or whichever government. This newspaper here, this radio here, will continue to do its job. Yog? Yeah, thank you, Leonard. Um, I disagree with a number of things the caller would have insinuated, but the caller, caller you have your right to your views. I, I, I you know, we, we respect that. But I'll tell you what, caller. You said that the PPP closed down um, sugar estates and, uh, you know, all, all the things that they did. But, you know, sir, I wish to remind you, that's why they're in opposition. They lost power because the population disagreed with their modus operandi. Here, we have a population that has also expressed their will on March 2nd. But there are people who believe that the will of the population doesn't matter. There are people who are telling this country, burn the ballot boxes. There are people who tell this country, in no matter how you vote, what matters is we don't trust one set. So it means you can lie, cheat, and steal all you want because the other side lied, cheat, and steal all they wanted. So where will we ever go if the right of the electorate is not respected? And Leonard, I wish to say, if I make an accusation here about, about ACNO AFC, we always end the program by saying we open the program for them to come and represent themselves. If we make an accusation against Jack Day or the PPP, we're inviting them to come and represent themselves. It is not a one-sided thing. And so we're always open and we're always appreciative of both sides. Like, like, and I wish to say this clearly, Leonard, if the media had not brought out the contract that, APNU, that the government of Guyana signed with that lobbying firm, it would have never changed. It would have remained that it was the government of Guyana. That, but when the matter hit the public, Mr. Grager did the decent thing and said, I know nothing about any contract and this government is not in any contract. And then what happened? A couple of weeks ago, Mr. David Granger, uh, Mr. Um, Joseph Harmon, and David Patterson went and they issued a new contract. The only thing I'll say on that note, it is very strange that in the new contract, these two private citizens of this country are putting as the number six that they're looking at infrastructure contracts as part of their outreach through the lobby firm. And that is unacceptable. And that too must be exposed by the, by the press. I thank you that, uh, for that, uh, Dr. Yog Mahadio. And so we go to the phone lines again. Good afternoon, caller. You on the air? Yeah, I'm glad the man said not SOP we're looking at. We're looking at statement of recount. So there's a GCOM said. GCOM said statement of recount is where they can declare the winner from, mm -hmm. not SOP. Well, let me go to the SOP. How you know that the SOP who you see is not a counterfeit one? You never see a $5,000 bill, good one, and a $5,000 bill counterfeit, and they look the same? Sir, I voted at the polling station. Sir, I voted at the polling station. I yes. stayed there. 
I stayed there myself. I stood up there and waited for the returning officer of the, the, the GCOM employee to bring the out the declared data. state of metaphor and he posted it there and I took a copy, I took a photograph of it. Which That's region? how I knew that one was Which original, that region? one was genuine. Which region? I don't have to tell you that, but I, I can share it with no, you. you. It is region me. four. You can say it is region one, four, five, or six. It is region four. Yeah, it's it's where, yeah, yeah it's yeah. region four. All right. Well, listen to this now. What do we turn it now? So, but, you sir, but, sir, but by saying what you said, you have just now accused Kaichor News, Starbrook yeah. News, and all the media houses for publishing false SOPs. That's what you have just accused everybody of doing. You are saying right. everybody yeah. else. Except Apu okay, has correct SOPs, and they are afraid they are hiding behind the skirt of their SOPs. Uh, listen to me, Nama. You can't just speak in here and listen to me. But you got to listen to, sir. I never, I never accuse nobody of giving fault. I tell how you know what they show you is not a fake one. Because we were the ones nobody who took the picture fake. of it. I never said fake. I tell how you know if it's not a fake one. We are the ones who took the picture of it in front of, of the polling places. Well... G come in working for an SOP though. They're working for a statement of recount. But you raise something there, you raise an issue there. What do you do? What do you do with the old statement of polls? Is that not part of the record, sir? No, no, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Why what listen, sir. You calling, I'm giving you the respect. Sir, Mr. Gill, you calling every single day. We're giving you the chance to say what you have to say. You gotta listen to. You're dominating yeah, the areas, but listen you, I can listen yeah, but, but hold on, man. Because we, I mean, if you know, no, but Leonard, cut the ju just one one question for Mr. Gale. Mr. Gale, as of yesterday, Mr. David Patterson was on television, on radio, calling on GCOM to uh, to go back to the SOPs and to declare a winner based on those SOPs. So the political party of APNO AFC has not given up on the SOPs. They're still insisting that GCOM must make a call on SOPs. Am I wrong, Leonard? David Patterson said so yesterday. Caller, you on the air, good afternoon. You on the air, good afternoon, sir. Hello? We would have lost that call. But yes, you know, let me say it. I, I hear your question, Yog. Let me say it. With regards to, we are looking at a recount that is happening right now. But there is ballots. There's ballots, there's boxes, there are records is there. I think going forward, uh, GCOM at this point in time cannot take those old statements, the polls is in the possession of the chief elections officer and throw it away and says, well, we're going to look at the old, uh, at the new um, the statement of recounts at this moment and say that that's it. Those old right. statements, the polls have to be kept in records. So let and, us... And Leonard, the, Leonard, the chairman of GCOM says until she has something to replace them with, she cannot throw them away. In other words, for all the uncounted boxes, the SOPs remain the legal document. So we go to the air again. Good afternoon. You're on the air. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ma'am. Leonard and after you, the is that the car goes now and say, but you say PPP win. Tell them me say PPP win. Them cheat. Them is a bully. Ah, the PPP got to win. Irfan has to swear. We from the country become. All right. Thank you, thank dear. You. Thank you very much, dear, the caller. Um, you. Uh, you know, l but let me look, say. Look, Leonard, emotions are obviously high across the country. Carla, we are very sorry um, to both of you. Uh, emotions are high, and you know, when one party calls in and insists on on one side, obviously there will be people else that will call in. And to that most recent caller, we are very sorry, but uh, you know, we understand your emotions. Um, and you know, our job here is, as you rightly said, Carla, is is to be very balanced and. Um, you certainly have your uh, your opinion and your belief, which is respected. And I think moving forward, let me say this, Yog. Moving forward, when it comes to, uh, to to the radio and so on, we want to open this to all Guyanese. They should we should have responsible conversation, mature conversation. 
let us don't look too much in the past what should have been there's a recount that is going on we should be paying attention to it so whether we say ppp would, would have fought, fought this or the apno would have fought that i, I think does not really help in the situation how do we move on from where we are uh, going to the next phase of where we want to have a government in place what should the government do this is the kind of conversation that we should be having you know we're going right. back to elections they going back going going back it doesn't do our people good we go to the air one last call good afternoon calling you in the air hi gildari and you very good afternoon to you good afternoon sir i i'm i'm from barbies i'm calling you from the fields in the enemy back then and I would normally get on to you. Um, once again, you're doing a good job. But my comment this afternoon is, you know, everyone is entitled to their opinion. I just listened to that lady. She was very emotional um, there. Uh, and the reason for this is because of what is happening in the whole process. We have seen SOPs being published by Kaichor, by Stabrook, by the PPP. And where is the SOP? From, from PNC. So it is clear in my analysis, and I think I, I, I am right, because if, if I were to analyze the situation, then you have to analyze the situation on the facts. And the fact is, the SOP that would have published by Kaichur, by Stabro, by PPP, is showing clearly that the PPP have won the election. However, Chief, we are into the recount, and we are here waiting for the results. And as a concerned citizen, as a Guyanese, I'm hoping that whoever is in charge, we doesn't have a government, but or whoever is in charge as caretaker in administrating this, this country should allow the process, because what I'm seeing, they're, they, they, they're, they're, they're enough evidence there to show that they are trying to undermine mm -hmm. this whole process. And I hope that the international observers and all the observers are paying keen attention. And this is one of my view again, that this is the reason that they don't want Carter Center to be here. Yes, I do thank you Carter for that. Cent Carter oh. Center should have been here. Carter Center is, is, an, is a they, are, they, they, they have looked at our election, they, they are accredited, and they should have been allowed. They are, they, they are prepared to follow the letter that you would have read earlier. They are prepared to mm. follow all the, 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 um, the condition that was laid out. And yet, the, the, the task force and Granger people doesn't want them to be here. Then we have to be careful. I yes. thank you very much for that. So we have to wrap up now, so very quickly. Yes, I, th I think we would have lost that call today. York, very quickly. So this evening in room 592, we would have uh, Mr. Hamilton Green, uh, former prime minister and, of course, the mayor of Georgetown, and he would have been a very senior official within the People's National Congress, and also he would have had his own par party, I think, Good and Green Guyana. Very quickly, what should we expect there? Expect a very open discussion. We will certainly ask him his opinion of, of, uh, of what's going on presently with the recount, with the way the 2020 elections have gone. And of course, we're going to hearken back to the days when he was, uh, you know, when he was prime minister in the uh, PNC heydays. So, yes, I look forward for a good discussion. Mr. Hamilton Green, former prime minister in room 592 tonight at 7.30 p.m. And of course, at uh, 8.15, we're going to be going over to Mr. Says Conrad for uh, uh, an elections update. Thank you very much for joining us there. And this is a special edition, or this was a special edition of the elections and COVID-19 watch. We're going to be back tomorrow at uh, 1.30 again. We apologize for what happened today with regards to the late start internet. So we're going to be back tomorrow and tonight, 7.30 on the dot, uh, room 592. Thank you very much there, Dr. Yogh Mahadeo, and everybody who's joined us. Thanks.